Perfect. Thank you, Alexa. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session, Geo Distributed Databases Engineering Around the Physics of Latency. This is the first of a series that we are going to be doing on this topic of Geo Distributed Databases. Given how often it comes up in conversations with customers, we think there's a lot of interest out there. So who are we? Quick introduction. My name is Sudarsh Srinivasan. I'm the VP of Solutions here at Yugabyte. I've been in enterprise tech for the past 15 years in a bunch of different roles, engineering, product, evangelism, solutions, marketing, and so on. And I worked at a number of companies doing interesting things, so Nutanix, Microsoft, a bunch of startups. So that's about me. And my partner in crime is Taylor Mull. Taylor, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sudarsh. Uh, my name is Taylor. Uh, I'm a senior data engineer here at Yugabyte. Uh, I've been working here for about nine months now. Uh, before that, I was working at Datastax um, as a support engineer, so I have a pretty familiar background with the, the NoSQL Cassandra um, databases. Uh, prior to that, I worked at Charter Communications for a couple of years, and uh, before that, I was actually a graduate from CU. Uh, appreciate your guys' time today. Awesome. We're looking forward to it. So let's jump in. I want to give you a bit of background about Yugabyte before we get into geo distribution itself. So Yugabyte is a transactional distributed SQL database built for resilience and scale. So Yugabyte is a great fit for OLTP workloads that entail real-time execution of transactions from a large number of people, right? Distributed SQL databases are deployed as a cluster of nodes that look like a single logical SQL database to your applications. So you get a SQL API, you get relational semantics, strong consistency, joins, indexes, and so on. Everything that if you've been in the database world, you're very familiar with. But behind the scenes, all the storage and query execution is distributed across the cluster. So you have no single points of failure, no bottlenecks, and so on. Right? By doing this, Yugabyte DB uniquely combines enterprise RDBMS capabilities. So you get things like uh, distributed asset transactions, uh, strong indexes, and so on. But you also get the resilience, linear scalability, and geo distribution of a cloud native architecture. Right? So it's bringing together the best of both worlds. And the way Yugabyte is, is built, it is a 100% open source database available under the Apache 2.0 license. And Yugabyte is built, designed to run in any cloud. So whether you have a private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, bare metal, VMs, containers, Yugabyte is going to run there, right? So bring it on. That is about Yugabyte DB. It's a very powerful database used by companies in a lot of different situations. Topic for today is geo distribution. So what is geo distribution? We found this definition that we liked. Geo distribution is where a geo distributed database is where a single database is spread across two or more geographically distinct locations and runs without experiencing performance delays in executing transactions. So I want to call out two specific things. When we talk about geographically distinct locations, we are talking about different, the, the, the database should be spread out across data centers, or you should be able to spread it out across availability zones if you are deploying it in the cloud or across regions that might span states, countries, even continents, right? So having a single database that you can spread out. And the second part that often people kind of question is performance delays, right? But physics, right? Because uh, when you talk about performance delays, there is a specific thing that we're talking about here because the moment, let's talk about the physics that people talk about, right? The moment you put data on a wire and try to communicate between two points, there is a latency, right? There is the, the packets take some time to go from point A to point B. And that delay often depends on, first of all, the theoretical limit, which is the speed of light, right? Because electrons are traveling at the speed of light. But then you also have transmission media, right? Are you sending data over wireless? Is it over cat five? Is it over fiber optics? What is the packet size? What is the packet loss rate? Is there protocol uh, kind of overhead involved? What is the signal strength? So a lot of factors which increase the latency of packets going from point A to point B, right? And one of the things you see is as the distance between the two points increases, typically the latency also increases. Everything else being equal, that is the situation, right? So if you look at AWS, for example, you're talking about communication latencies which are in the one to two millisecond range if you're within like 100, 150, uh, mile radius. So within the, say the Bay Area, or the Western, West Coast, if you're going coast to coast, that's around 50 to 60 milliseconds of latency for a packet to go from one to the other. And then if you're going from, uh, you know, Western United States to Australia, that is about 150 milliseconds, 
right? So we're talking about real addition of latencies here. The way this manifests is, let's take an example where you have a user who's in Australia trying to access an application, a shopping cart app in the Eastern seaboard, which in turn is talking to a database that is sitting in the West Coast, right? Now you're talking about a request going from the user to the shopping cart, to the database and the data coming back the same way, right? So you have to think about adding up all these different latencies and that can actually add up. You're talking about like half a second almost of latency in terms of uh, you know, response time for the user. So this is important to keep in mind that you should try to keep your data close to the usage and keep your compute close to the data in order to minimize the amount of latency that users perceive, right? Especially when it comes to uh, applications that require customer engagement. So that is of course, one of the reasons why companies choose to geo-distribute databases, right? Performance, your customers and users are located around the world. So moving your data close to usage and moving compute close to your data lowers your latency, right? And the, and the round trip time. The other of course is resilience, right? The fact is data centers, availability zones, even entire regions can fail. And we have seen examples of this just in the past few months where we had the Texas snowstorm and we had an entire data center go down. We have the uh, OVH data center fire where a cloud data center was essentially burning. And, and that unfortunately is a picture there, right? You have a data center burning. Applications and databases have to be built so that they are resilient and available in spite of failures in the underlying infrastructure, right? So the key thing here is how do you build it in such a way that even if an entire zone or region becomes unavailable, your database and app are still running. And the third piece, of course, is increasingly we are finding countries that, are, that have laws that essentially say their citizens' data should be collected, processed, and stored in the, within the, the boundaries of that country, right? So data residency laws require that you keep the data within that country. So three main reasons why you'd want to geo-distribute your database, uh, resilience, performance, compliance. And we're going to talk about each of these in turn. So the way we're gonna do it, Yugabyte again, offers a wide variety of options when it comes to geo distribution. I'm gonna walk you through some of these core concepts and Taylor is gonna come in and give the real world perspective. Taylor it works in the field with customers. So he's gonna talk about how customers are using these capabilities in the Yugabyte BB uh, platform to essentially deploy geo distributed databases. So let's get back to how Yugabyte is architected, right? Yugabyte DB, is deployed as a cluster of nodes where each node you can think of as having three layers. You have an API layer that is talking to the application. So it could be SQL. We also have a SQL compatible API. So that's talking to the application. Then you have a distributed query execution layer that is actually talking to the nodes are talking to each other and actually executing the query. And then you have a distributed data store layer where all the data is being distributed across the entire cluster, right? Now these nodes can be deployed across data centers, across availability zones, across the regions, and still they're talking to each other in order to do the work that they need to do as a logical database. User tables, so any table that you store is gonna be sharded into what we call tablets, where a tablet is a group of rows in that database. Now tablets are evenly distributed across all the nodes of the cluster in such a way that the sharding and the data distribution are completely transparent to the user and the application, right? As far as the app is concerned, it talks to any node, it's as if it's talking to the entire database and the nodes take care of communicating with each other to make sure that data is being replicated, it is being stored in a truly distributed fashion across the cluster, okay? That's an important point. Now, Taylor, do you want to talk about how this compares with some of the other databases that we've seen in the market? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So as we all know, you know, we're definitely not the only database out there that's kind of doing these uh, distributed SQL. Um, so two of the common ones we see right now are Amazon Aurora and Google Spanner. Um, some of the differences that we have between them is for Aurora, let's take, for example, this is one of the fastest growing products for AWS in the past few years and has direct compatibility with Postgres. The main issue when you compare this to Yugabyte is scale. There's no option to horizontally scale with Aurora, which can lead users to run a kind of a vertical scale wall where there's just no way around it at times. Now on the flip side, we have Google Spanner, which does a great job at scaling around that vertical scale wall. But the main drawback here is it lacks a number of the RDB BMS features that many of its users need when compared to Yugabyte or Aurora, which makes adoption more difficult and may have users actually end up having to redesign their app in order to use it. The other big app that I want to, or it's big database I want to bring up that's a comparison 
is Cassandra. So as you can see on the left there, we have two main query layers. You have the SQL and the YSQL. So we compare for our YSQL app, uh, API, it compares very uh, similarly to Cassandra. What Cassandra is able to do is it does a fantastic job at horizontal scaling and has that built-in HA when nodes or DCs fail, similar to Yugabyte. However, the one place that it has some major fallbacks is with consistency. If your app requires you to have that acid level compliance, Cassandra just really isn't an option there because of their need to be, or by their design to be eventually consistent. What Yugabyte's done is taken you know, each piece, each pieces from each one of these databases and some of these learnings and create this new database that can horizontally scale, has these all these RDBMS features that are required for a lot of these applications, but then also has the ability to be asset compliant, uh, which makes it a lot easier for, you know, you know with the, all this compatibility for users to adopt. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. So as we said, you know, every, every user table is automatically sharded into tablets each tablet in a Yugabyte cluster is replicated across all the nodes, across the nodes in the cluster, right? And the replication, the number of copies depends on what we call the replication factor. So if you have an RF3 cluster, then each tablet is replicated and you have three different copies of it that are distributed across the cluster. Yugabyte uses a protocol called RAF, which is a consensus protocol to elect a leader. So each tablet also has a leader, which is, which is gonna handle all the reads and writes as we will see. So the leader election and the replication process use raft, right? So now once the data is replicated, all rights are replicated to all the tablet peers and they need to be acknowledged by at least a majority of the peers before the write succeeds, right? So in the critical path of the write, you're gonna have the data being replicated. So this makes sure that even if a node were to go down, you don't have inconsistency, and you don't have data loss, right? This is critical. So all uh, a majority of the peers have to acknowledge before the write is sent back. Reads and writes, as I mentioned earlier, are served by the tablet leader by default. So I'm going to kind of talk about kind of the exception there. For writes, it is always going to be served by the tablet leader. So this is the syn syn uh, synchronous replication process that we talked about, right? Synchronous replication is where in the critical path of that actual write operation, data is being replicated. This is important for a couple of reasons. Consistency, so making sure that you're able to read consistent data from the database. And the second is resilience. If you have a node going down, you still have access to that data and the data you have is the latest version of that data. Now, synchronous replication, as we had mentioned, you can take the nodes of the cluster and either deploy them in different availability zones of a region, or you can deploy them across different regions, right? So you can have a multi-region, what we call a stretch cluster. But as we had mentioned earlier in the physics of latency, there is, data, there is a lot of communication between the nodes of a cluster in order to do things. So the moment you're increasing the distance between the nodes of the cluster, you can expect that the latency is gonna go up, right? So these are three common modes that we have seen customers deploy Yugabyte. If you want zone level resilience, that is you want to have the ability to fail over even if there is a zone going down, you want, you want availability, you do multi-zone deployments. And if you want uh, region level resilience, then you go for the single cloud multi-region deployments. And Taylor, feel free to jump in and add what you've seen in terms of uh, deployments. Yeah, most commonly what we see is really, you know, that, that first single region or the multi-region. Uh, one of the, I think one of the really the big strengths is our ability to launch in multi-cloud, multi-region. You can have, you know, the, the fantastic part is you're not really tied to any one of those vendors, you can, you can jump from Google, AWS, even on-prem, and even have that all within the same cluster, which is just fantastic. And it gives you really that flexibility uh, to choose the vendor um, that you'd like to use. Awesome. Yeah. And, and in a, the middle thing that we're talking about, the uh, stretch cluster, single cloud multi-region, you're actually taking a single gigabyte cluster and deploying the nodes in different regions, right? So you actually have these nodes talking to each other to kind of maintain that, that view of a single logical database. And so you get the strong consistency that comes guaranteed as part of the Yugabyte cluster. You get all the goodness off a, a single Yugabyte cluster, but then in doing so, the write latency goes up, right? Because every write now has to be acknowledged by a majority of the nodes. So write latency will go up and we'll talk about the read latency. So by default, as I had said, reads are served by the leader of this particular tablet, right? It's at the tabular, tablet granularity. Now, Oh, before we go there, do we want to talk about a customer story? 
Like yeah, who's absolutely. using this right now in the field? Yeah, absolutely. I'll definitely dive into it. So one of the customers who's currently using this synchronous architecture is a, a top five global retailer that operates stores across the world. Currently what they use Yugabyte for is their source of record for the product catalog. This catalog has millions of items that need to be queried hundreds of thousands of times per second. They also need to be able to scale during peak traffic times like Cyber Monday, Black Friday, and during COVID. A lot of things that we were hearing from some of these large retailers was that basically during COVID, it was like Black Friday every single day. So being able to scale up uh, during this time was really important for them. While their previous solution, Cassandra, allowed for scaling, one of the major problems them, as we previously talked about, is consistency. What Yugibet gave them in the synchronous setup is the ability to have acid level uh, consistency, which ended up saving them millions in lost revenue per year. So here's the current topology setup. Uh, the reason why I wanna bring this up is that as many of you know, there was this major snowstorm that hit Texas last, last year that caused a major power outage pretty much across the entire state. Uh, during this time, as you can see, they actually had one of their major regions in, that, uh, in Texas. So when they had this outage, that entire data center went down. And even though this, uh, made this, this storm and this data center going down caused outages across the state, because of the way that they had this multi-region set up, they actually had zero downtime and had no real impact on the application. What ended up happening was those other two regions picked up the traffic from the South Texas region and just started feeding those queries. You know, there was the, that, you know, anything that was kind of local ended up being a little bit farther away. So there was some ad latencies, but there was actual no downtime for the app, which is fantastic. That is really cool. Another closely related topic to synchronous replication is what is called follower reads. So to understand what follower reads are, remember that we had talked about how all reads are served by default by the leader of a tablet, right? And there's a reason for that, because if you look at what we're showing here, say the leader receives a write request to a certain data point, changing the value from 15 to 20, right? Write request is received, the leader synchronously tries to replicate that to the two followers in an RF3 cluster. And as soon as one of the other followers acknowledges that it has received it and, and committed it, the write is then completed, right? So now you have at least two of those nodes of those replicas have the new value of 20, which is good, right? Because that's how you kind of preserve that value. Now, say you got a read request at this point, right? If the leader received that write request, which is the default, you're gonna respond with the, the latest value, which is 20. But say follower two got that read request. Right, follower two still hasn't updated with that latest value of 20. So you're gonna get the stale value of 15 if that read is served by follower two. So this is the reason why you wanna have the leader by default kind of serving reads because you wanna get the latest value that is committed, right? Now, of course, eventually the table is gonna be fully replicated and every node is gonna have the latest value. That should be 20 in that last node, right? So follower reads are one mechanism by which you say, say follower two is a node that is very close geographically to a customer that is far away, right? By serving the read from follower two, you're essentially trading off some of the freshness of the data. So you can get, there's a chance that you might get a slightly stale copy of the data, but in return, you're getting a read that is blazingly fast, right? So follower reads allow you to trade off latency for accuracy or the other way around, accuracy for latency, right? You're giving up some data accuracy, you're getting some latency. So this is another mechanism and you've set follower reads at the app level because there might be applications where you're okay with slightly stale data and there is something called bounded staleness. So you can say, how stale can that data be, right? And so you can say, I'm okay if the data is a little bit stale, but I want very fast, very low latency, then you go for follower reads. The third concept is cross-cluster or X-cluster asynchronous replication. Now, this is a capability in Yugabyte DB where you can basically have two Yugabyte DB clusters that are separated by, by you know, in, in completely different regions. And these clusters are either replicating in one direction or bi-directionally, right? So you can have asynchronous replication where data in one cluster is being replicated to another cluster and vice versa. Right, so unidirectional or bidirectional replication. And this is asynchronous as we call out. So you're basically getting within each of these clusters, data is consistent and all the replication is synchronous, but then across clusters, it is asynchronous. So it is not happening you know, in the right path. So that means that the clusters can be far apart. This is a great deployment mode for backup and disaster recovery, right? Customers who want to have 
the ability to fail over to another cluster if there's a failure in one would go for something like X cluster asynchronous replication. And Taylor, jump in here and uh, give us the perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this is, you know, coming from a, a, a Cassandra background, this is definitely one of those areas where you get basically the same exact consistency when you're going across, but within each one of these clusters, you have that high asset compliance. So even though, you know, we say in this kind of deployment, when we have to get data from one side to the other, you do have that eventual consistency. If your app for the most part is staying very local to one of these regions, you still have that very strong asset compliance. It's just then you're sending that data across, as Suda said, you know, as either a backup or just to have an extra copy on that side with that eventual replication. So it's definitely something that many of uh, you know people who use Cassandra and are looking to switch to Yugabyte, they see this deployment and see this as a great thing. Perfect. So yeah, actually just go, kind of going off that, here's one of those use cases that is currently using the async replication. Um, currently Kroger uh, is one of those that's using that. Kroger is a massive supermarket chain in the United States with thousands of supermarkets and department stores across the country. Uh, recently, they've been investing heavily in growing their digital footprint with the onset of COVID-19. One of the major use cases they actually brought to Yugabyte was the shopping list service where Yugabyte is a source of record for a majority of the United States and millions of users. So basically what shopping list is, is when you go online and you kind of create a shopping list, that's all backed by Yugabyte. So all those items you put in there, that information, that's stored in Yugabyte. In this use case, what they're using ASIC and replication for is for the full backup of the database in case of that major outage, as Suda had mentioned previously. Um, in this topo topology, they have their normal synchronous cluster, but then they have that second cluster, which is being replicated to in case of a major disaster. What they can do in this disaster scenario is switch traffic over to that sync cluster and immediately start servicing reads and writes since all the data has already been synced to that cluster. This is what is commonly known as the active passive scenario that many current, uh, many current uh, RDBMS databases use in order to achieve resilience. With Yugabyte, there's already the resilience in the sync cluster, but async and replication can be used as an extra safety net. Great point, Taylor. And in fact, yeah, Kroger is actually doing both, right? They have synchronous replication and they actually have a multi-zone uh, cluster for their, their OLTP applications. And then they actually replicate it across regions for backup DR additional protection, right? And some of the other things worth calling out here, I mean, multi-cloud is a big priority for them. All the stuff that we talked about, you can deploy Yugabyte in one cloud, many clouds, you want to kind of dial where you want to deploy your workloads, we give you complete flexibility. So that's something that plays up well here. So the fourth concept that we're going to talk about are read replicas. Okay, so one of the things that Yugabyte offers, you know, so there is a Yugabyte cluster, which is kind of the primary cluster, and you can have one or more, zero or more read replicas of that primary cluster. Read replicas essentially have copies of the data, but they're used only to serve reads. Right, so read replicas are not used for resilience or failover. Unlike what we just talked about with asynchronous replication, read replicas are purely for serving super fast, low latency reads pretty much anywhere in the world. So it's a one directional data transfer, right? You basically have a primary cluster and the, the data from there being replicated to read replicas. Because read replicas are not serving as kind of availability uh, zones themselves, they can basically have just two, two nodes in the cluster, right? So read replicas do not have to have that minimum of three nodes that you would need in order to have a fully resilient cluster. And you can have as many read replicas as you need just to keep the data around the world, right? So if you have a primary database in one location, you can have read replicas in pretty much all the continents and serve that data uh, from that primary cluster. Yeah, and one thing I would love to just add here is, you know, we've, we've kind of go over a few of these concepts, but you know, when you start thinking about specifically when I think of read replicas and async replication, um, you can start combining these together. So where you, know, you have this map here where you have just this one cluster sitting on the West Coast. But what if you wanted to have, you know, this West Coast cluster, a European cluster, but then you have these edge locations that are a little bit tougher to get to. You may not have as high a traffic where you may not need to have the high read and write. And then we throw a read replica down there just, in, just to have that really fast reads if say for just a particular number of tables or majority of your app needs those fast reads and you're willing to give up a little bit on the rights. But the nice thing here is you could start combining some of these different uh, technologies and different co concepts that we've been talking to really speed up your reads and writes across the entire application. 
Yeah. And I think the next customer we're going to talk about is a very uh, interesting and apt kind of use case for read replicas. Yes, exactly. So Admiral is not really a well-known name, but I, the next time you go to a website with an ad blocker and it tells you to turn it off or pay up, that's probably Admiral that's driving that with Yugabyte in the back end. This is one of Admiral's core offerings and they came to Yugabyte because they need high performance across the globe. All the major browsers, including Safari, Firefox, and Chrome have added tracking protection. We'll phase out third-party cookies pretty much entirely here soon. This alone is kind of expected to drop ad revenues for some of these publishers by about half, unless they can figure out an alternative, which is where Admiral actually comes in. What Admiral offers its customers is a way to bypass um, this and, and connect publishers with their users directly. For Admiral, in order to do this, the speed of the reads was critical. So they had to get millisecond latencies across the globe, which they utilized read rep clusters to do this. So this is actually the topology that they have right now. So as you can see, this topology stretches around the globe in order to achieve the latency requirements in each region. They have a single synchronous cluster that stretches across the United States in the US West, uh, Central and East region. And then they have two read replica clusters set up in Europe and Asia. With this setup, they're actually able to achieve global read speeds close to three milliseconds in latency, which is just blazing fast. Yeah, so I mean, one, one point aside here is when you're talking about geo-distributed deployments, you know, people often think that latency is, it's a physics uh, thing. So you really cannot do much. The moment you have a database that is spread out over such a big geography, you have to resign yourself to very high latencies, right? So when the title, coming back to why we picked that title, engineering around the physics of latency, depending on your application and depending on the trade-offs that you're willing to make, you can actually deploy your database in such a way that you can get single digit millisecond latencies for an application that truly is distributed around the world. Right. And so this is an important point. You are, of course, trading off. There is no, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And there is, of course, the physics of latency that you have to work around. But it turns out that it's more an engineering problem than a scientific limitation, right? Because your application does not need to check all the boxes on strong consistency, uh, super high, low latency, and, you know, geo distribution or isolation across the board. So pick kind of what is important to you as you design the application and deploy your database and pick the deployment that works for your applications. And that is the, the side point here. So the FIP concept, come, you know, continuing that theme, we we've talked about synchronous replication, asynchronous replication, both single directional and bi-directional. We talked about follower reads as well. And then we talked about read replicas. The FIP concept is row level geo partitioning, right? This is the concept where you take a single table and you can pin specific rows of that table to specific geographies, depending on what that, that column has, right? So for example, if you have a row where you have a geo value of US, you can pin all those rows that have a certain geo value to the US, right? And similarly, if you have a geo, which is UK, you can pin all the rows of that table to UK and so on. Yugabyte has been supporting row level geo partitioning for a couple of versions now, a couple of releases. And this allows you to basically take a single table and break it up and basically keep the data within specific geographies, both for latency and for compliance reasons. Right. And the cool thing about this is in each region, you basically have enough nodes that you can keep all the replicas of the data. Because remember, you have to have all the data, all the shards of the tablet be replicated within the cluster. So you have enough nodes in each region that the, all the replicas of that tablet are also being stored within that region. So you don't ever have to cross the continent to go and maintain this cluster. Right. So if you have a nine node cluster, each of these regions are basically talking within uh, to the nodes within that region itself, right? So you get strong consistency. It is a single global database, but then you have rows being pinned to different parts of the uh, database of the of the world, right? Now we're talking about breaking up a table. You can also have a table and its indexes being pinned differently, right? So you can have a master table and its indexes pinned differently. Taylor would love for you to get into that in a little more detail. Yeah, absolutely. Before we switch on, there's one thing I did want to touch on is that. Um, as we've been talking about, there's all of this, you know, engineering around this latency and, and consistency and global distribution. Um, in this particular case, you know, we're, one of the things I'd like to call out is when you start pinning things to different locations, locally, you get these fantastic, you know, performance. But when you start talking about trying to then grab the data from a different uh, region altogether, you do start some, sometimes having to get that latency price. But again, this is all just how we engineer around these types of problems. And there's a lot of different ways we can get around this. Um, 
but you know, Yugabyte gives you so many different options to engineer around the solution. And to be honest, row level geo partitioning was one of those ones where I, I kind of nerded out a little bit on it um, just because it was such a great technology that we've added. Awesome. And are there any examples that you can talk about? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the two different, you know, kind of two different examples that I'd like to touch on, um, you know, as Stu mentioned, the first way is by that we can do this geo partitioning. Uh, is by doing it at the table level. So where you split the user-defined table partitions and then pin those partitions to the desired geographic locations. Uh, so say we have this imaginary bank, we'll call it Yuga Bank, uh, which offers an online banking service for users in countries by processing you know, their deposits, withdrawals, and transfers. They require a number of different features in order to properly uh, serve their customers around the globe. First, obviously, would be the high consistency and high availability. Uh, when I go to withdraw money from my account or go to deposit, I hope, I, you know, it better be that it's consistent. Um, with Yugabyte and using this real level geo partitioning, that we are automatically right there uh, asset compliant. So, and with that geo to redundancy, you also have that high availability. So the other feature would be high performance, which where geo partitioning really starts to make an impact. In order to have the, that good customer experience, we want to have the transaction be processed in the lowest latency possible. If we're gonna use a standard RDD BMS, that would cut customers say who are, we have you know just a central location in Europe and a customer in, in the United States, they would have to pay that latency price in order to even just do the simple things like looking up what's in their account or making simple withdrawals. But with geo partitioning, we can pin the data to the local Yugabyte region, allowing for better performance and end user experience. Uh, another major feature where geo partitioning really starts to shine is with security and compliance. Earlier, Suda talked about GDPR. So that's a great example that we can use for this. So with GDPR compliance, what that requires is that all personal EU data be stored in the EU. With geopartitioning, we can pin the customer's data who live in the EU to that local EU Yugabyte region and comply with these requirements. The only caveat in that one is obviously if we start making foreign transactions from the US, you do have to pay that latency price. But the great part is, is that we aren't running into any problems with GDPR. So the second example of how we can do the geo uh, partitioning is using duplicate indexes. So what duplicate indexes are, are when we have multiple indexes on the same column within the same table. This is a great fit for when the index is read very frequently across multiple regions, but not really updated on a regular basis. The reason for this is that if you have a copy of each one index in each one of those regions, when you make a write, you do have to make a write to each one of those indexes. So in this case, these are great for lookup tables. Uh, and that's usually what we would recommend for that. So an example where this could be a good fit, let's say is for a car renting company uh, with a website that allows you to lease a car if you're choosing, which you can either pick up, delivered, or, or what have you from the office near to you, nearest to your location. So in this case, it would, end, it would be really important to the end user for their lookups of the, say the types of cars that you can rent to be very fast. And since the types of cars don't change very often, what we can do is end up adding these uh, duplicate indexes to each one of these regions so that when the user goes to look up the types of cars available, it's really quick and they can get that car as fast as possible. So when you have this, you know, you have the local data right next to you and giving the customers the lowest latency possible. Perfect. Thanks, Taylor. And yeah. folks, we have, if you have any questions, please start posting them. I see a couple of questions come in. I will, I will try to answer them. What is the default transaction isolation level in Yugabyte, and will Yugabyte support all the isolation levels that PostgreSQL supports? Sorry, I'm just pulling up uh, something that is useful here. Give me one second, folks. Accidental click. Uh, where was I? Okay, so. Does Yugabyte support all isolation levels? So Yugabyte supports snapshot and serializable isolation levels. So two of the four that are, that are part of the SQL standard. Uh, and is it is linearizability assured? Yes. So linearizability of transactions is assured. So uh, that is kind of default in the Yugabyte system. We just got another question. If there are several clusters distributed and geopartitioning being used, how does backup work? Is there one backup for the whole database, one for each node or dot, dot, dot? 
Taylor, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, it'll just be a backup for the whole cluster. So you'll back up everything to the whole cluster. Um, so yeah, so you can back up straight straight to S3 in that particular scenario. Awesome. So that's usually how we do that is, you know, you see S3 being used as a backup location. NFS is another option. Cool. So do want to provide a quick summary of all the different options that we talked about, because as we just saw, Yugabyte offers a whole bunch of options for you in terms of geo distribution. So we talked about the multi-zone cluster where you have the nodes of a single cluster being deployed in different zones of a region. We have multi-region stretch clusters where again, you can take all the nodes, stretch them and, and place them in different regions, right? Then you have X cluster asynchronous replication, which can be single directional or bi-directional. And then you have read replicas, which are copies, read only copies of the data that is in the primary cluster. And finally you have geo partitioning where you can take a single table or indexes of a table and place them, pin them to different geographies around the world. As you can see here in each of these options, you're trading off between consistency, read latency, write latency, you're trading off different things, right? So you get different levels of resilience. For example, in a multi-zone cluster, you get strong consistency and sub 10 millisecond latencies, but in the process, you're basically getting only zone level resilience. So if the entire region goes down, your cluster is down, right? Similarly, if you, if you go for a stretch cluster, by default, you're getting high write latency and high read latency, but you get strong consistency. Now with follower reads, you can tune some of that. You can basically say, I'm okay with stale reads, but give me super low read latency. And so that is a fact, that's something that you can tune. The key point we wanna make here is ahead of time, most customers don't know all the needs that they will have, right? And you shouldn't have to pick different databases depending on which of these modes you want in your, in your data, right? Yugabyte gives you its most, it is the most versatile database when it comes to the number of different options that you have for geo-distributed uh, deployments. So you can basically take a single gigabyte cluster and decide how you want to deploy this, right? And we've had customers who've actually switched. They've, they've deployed a primary cluster and then they realize that they need uh, another cluster that they start backing up to. So they deploy a secondary cluster and then they have uh, X cluster replication between them, right? Or they can deploy one or more read replicas and have the cluster up and running. So this is an important factor. The fact that you have flexible deployments all from a single database means that your database choice is not limiting you in terms of what you're able to do with Yugabyte. So summary of key concepts, all the data is synchronously replicated in a Yugabyte DB cluster by default. Nodes can be placed. So, uh, you know, a Yugabyte DB cluster is basically a collection of nodes that talk to each other and present a single logical database. The nodes can be placed in different regions or different zones, depending on what you need. Reads and writes are handled by default by the tablet leader, but you can set it up in such a way that follower reads. So basically you're not reading from the leader of the tablet, but from one of the followers. Follower reads trade off data freshness in exchange for lower latency. Right, so you get data that could be stale, but in exchange, you're getting lower latency. We also offer a capability called X cluster replication, which is asynchronous replication of data between clusters. And this is primarily used for backup and DR. We have a capability called read replicas where you can take a primary cluster and create read only copies of it. So any writes that are trying that you, if a user tries to attempt a write to a, one of the read replicas, that write gets redirected to the primary cluster, which where you incur that latency, right? So a read replica cannot take writes, but it's used for super low latency reads from around the world. So if you have data that doesn't change too frequently, read replicas are a great way for you to kind of serve reads around the world. Geo partitioning allows you to break up a table and pin specific rows of the table to different parts of the world, right? So specific geographic regions. All these options allow you to prioritize depending on what you need, resilience, data freshness, compliance, and latency. Right. So you're able to hit exactly what your application needs without having to uh, pick at the database level which database you're going for. So with that, let's switch to the questions. Uh, does Yugabyte support materialized views? Taylor, do you know the answer to that? I don't uh, know no, we, we don't. We know we do not support materialized views. Okay. 
All right, folks, any other questions? I do want to add, you know, we are on Slack. We love Slack. We love GitHub. So please join us on Slack. We would love to have continue this discussion. If you have any other questions about geo-distributed databases, the next session, just as a preview, we're going to be talking about best practices, kind of continuing on the theme of engineering. When you deploy a database in a geo-distributed fashion, there are things that you can do to make sure that it is performing at its best, right? In terms of being able to have super low latencies and so on. So we're going to talk about some of that next level of what you can do in a cluster that Yugabyte offers, configurability that lets you, you know, improve your latency while maintaining the same level of resilience. I do want to add that materialized view are something we have in our pipeline. It's not supported yet, but we're definitely looking to do that in the future. Perfect. All right. If there are no more questions, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in one of these future webinars. And thank you, Taylor, for joining. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Suda. And I appreciate everyone's time today. And hope you had uh, fun with this webinar. Bye, everyone.